holiday travel threat. Overnight hailstorms and icy roads causing a 50 car pileup out west. Now the new storm set to wreak havoc coast to coast as a record number of Americans get ready to travel. Rob has the latest track and timing. Warning to the White House. On the final day of hearings, the Russian expert who sounds the alarm testifying that the president and his allies are pushing conspiracy theories straight from Putin's playbook. In the course of this investigation, I would ask that you please not promote politically driven falsehoods that so clearly advance Russian interests. All of this as President Trump rallies Republicans for the next phase of the impeachment showdown. Protecting the professor. Outrage growing after a major university refuses to fire a teacher accused of sending racist, sexist, and homophobic tweets, claiming he's protected by the First Amendment. Now he's speaking out on GMA. Vacation nightmare. An American couple claims they're being held against their will at a hospital in Mexico after getting ill on a cruise. Their fight to be freed right now. Victoria's Secret shakeup. Why the company is putting an end to their famous fashion show. Meet the Cybertruck. Overnight, Tesla unveiling their new bulletproof electric pickup. But the moment their demonstration goes wrong, twice. Black Friday frenzy. The deals that just dropped at midnight a week ahead of the shopping holiday. How to know what you should buy right now. Live in Times Square, this is Good Morning America. Good morning, America. Hope you're well this Friday morning. You can feel the holiday season starting. Do you want to, though? Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get through Thanksgiving first. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But we are going to begin this morning with that nasty weather moving coast to coast right now. Powerful storms packing heavy rain, snow, and ice. And take a look. More than 50 cars caught in a pileup overnight in Colorado. And those storms are moving right into, yes, the holiday week. Rob is starting us off with the very latest. Everybody wants to know the path and timing of this thing, Rob. Well, we've been very active pattern shaping up, TJ, and this is that scene outside of Denver along I-25. 50 car pile. This was a mixture of freezing rain and snow. There were some injuries with this, but nothing life-threatening, thank goodness. A lot of people are starting their holiday travel this week, and this storm in the west is going to be moving towards the east quite rapidly over the weekend. So let's zoom into what's happening in the northeast, where it really will ramp up come Sunday. So with this will be a lot of heavy rain. You'll see it across the southeast, the mid-Atlantic as well. But come Sunday, we're looking at the heavy rain here along the I-95 corridor. So if you're traveling up 87, I think you'll turn into some mountain snow in the Catskills, the Berkshires, maybe accumulating in the Green Mountains and the White Mountains of, uh, of interior New England, but heavy rain from New York up through New Haven and up through Boston. That is Sunday, but we look ahead towards next week, and a very active pattern is developing. Whenever you get the jet stream to dip down like it does this here in the West, that means a storm out in the West, cold rain there and snow, and another storm here. This is Thanksgiving Day in the middle of the country, and then this one heads towards the Northeast by Sunday. Very active. George, over to you. Coming. Okay, Rob, thanks very much to Washington now, and the latest on the impeachment showdown. As the White House braces for a likely Senate trial, one of the most compelling witnesses yet closed out two weeks of marathon hearings. Fiona Hill, who is the top Russia expert in the White House, slammed the president's pressure campaign on Ukraine, saying she predicted this is going to blow up. Senior congressional correspondent Mary Bruce is tracking it all from Capitol Hill. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, George. Well, Fiona Hill said it was her moral obligation to come before Congress, and in blunt testimony, she detailed how the president and his allies have undercut official foreign policy and warned that they are being driven by conspiracy theories pushed by the Russians. It was a dramatic end here to three days of high-stakes hearings. The week's final witness, Fiona Hill, a former Russia expert on the National Security Council, came to Congress with a stark warning for Republicans. Some of you on this committee appear to believe that Russia and its security services did not conduct a campaign against our country, and that perhaps, somehow, for some reason, Ukraine did. This is a fictional narrative that has been perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services themselves. I would ask that you please not promote politically driven falsehoods that so clearly advance Russian interests. Hill said Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, was selling conspiracy theories straight from Putin's playbook and that Trump was buying it. Is it your understanding then that President Trump disregarded the advice of his senior officials about this theory and instead listened to Rudy Giuliani's views? That appears to be the case, yes. Hill detailed two competing channels of foreign policy that were often directly at odds. Republicans pressing her on a tense moment she had with Trump's point man in Ukraine, the EU ambassador Gordon Sondland. I was upset with him that he wasn't fully telling us about all of the meetings that he was having. And he said to me, but I'm briefing the president. I'm briefing Chief of Staff Mulvaney. I'm briefing Secretary Pompeo, and I've talked to Ambassador Bolton. He was being involved in a domestic political errand. 
and we were being involved in national security foreign policy, and those two things had just diverged. Hill explained how that domestic political errand later turned into a quid pro quo. That Sondland explained to her the Ukrainians would only get a coveted meeting with the president if they announced the investigations Trump was demanding. Also testifying, David Holmes, an American diplomat in Ukraine. He says he overheard the president himself on a phone call with Sondland discussing the Ukrainian president. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it. I have a clear recollection that these statements were made. Republicans tried to attack Hill's credibility. Dr. Hill, you have provided me probably the greatest uh, piece of, of, of evidence that's before us to illustrate the problem with hearsay. But Hill pushed back. I've talked about things I heard with my own ears. We're here to relate to you what we heard, what we saw, and what we did. And to be of some help to all of you, in really making a very momentous decision here. After more than 30 hours of public hearings, the president's allies say the impeachment inquiry is nothing more than a sham. I think the American people see through it. They see that the facts are on the president's side, and they know this process has been entirely unfair. But Democrats say the evidence is clear. The president abused his power. There is nothing more dangerous than an unethical president who believes they are above the law. We are better than that. Now, while the hearings were wrapping up here over at the White House, they are trying to keep Republicans in line and strategize what comes next. The president yesterday met with key Republicans, including Senator Mitt Romney, who has been one of his fiercest critics. And later, White House officials sat down with other Republicans trying to, to come up with a game plan to tackle what they believe is a, a near certain trial in the Senate. So, Mary, let's look at what comes next. It appears that the Intelligence Committee has done this is it for public hearings. They're not going to call anybody else, most likely. So this will go to the House Judiciary Committee. They'll draft up the articles of impeachment after they get a report from the Intelligence Committee. That goes to the House floor. They're still hoping by the end of the year to vote on impeachment. And then comes that Senate trial you were just talking about. So take us inside the, the, the talks between the, the White House and Republicans on how they're thinking about this, how they plan to go forward with the trial. Well, George, there does seem to be a, a little bit of a dispute here. Republicans seem divided over the best strategy, particularly when it comes to the timing here. Some are advocating for a short trial, perhaps as short as just two weeks. The argument there is that trying to limit the time may, may also limit the political damage to the president, while others are pushing for a longer, more drawn-out process. That would give some of these key moderate Republicans a chance to show voters that they are taking this seriously. And, George, a longer process could put those Senate Democrats in a tricky position, those who are running for president because it could come up against those first early contests. Yeah, and the president is torn between wanting this over and wanting to have a full full defense mounted by those senators. Okay, Mary, thanks very much. Cecilia? Okay, George, there are also some new developments in the race for the White House this morning. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has just taken a major step toward running for the Democratic presidential nomination. Lindsay Thank Davis has more from the Bloomberg Tower here in Midtown Manhattan. Good morning, Lindsay. Hey, good morning to you, Cecilia. Okay, so here's the big announcement. The headline basically is that Michael Bloomberg is officially dipping his toe into the presidential waters. This is just a procedural move and not at all an official announcement. But by filing paperwork with the Federal Election Commission, it officially declares the former New York mayor a candidate for president of the United States, and it allows him to raise money for a run for the White House. But Bloomberg's people are telling ABC News this is just one step, not a final decision to run. Now, that said, Bloomberg has also filed to appear on the ballot in five states and is spending more than $100 million on ads and voter registration efforts in key states. Now, this all reportedly propelled by the billionaire's concerns about if the current frontrunners could actually defeat President Trump. Now, uh, a little bit of trivia for you this morning. I'm sure that George already knows this off the top of his head, but the last time that this apparent uh, strategy actually worked as far as bypassing the early contest and then going on to nab the nomination, 1968 with Hubert Humphrey. Says George. I, I hadn't had that at the top of my head. I'm glad oh. you reminded me, Lindsay. No, Thanks no. very much. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Lindsay. We're going to go overseas now to Israel, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been indicted, facing bribery and fraud charges. He's trying to hold on to his job, claiming he's the victim of a coup attempt. And our foreign correspondent, James Logan, has the latest from London. Good morning, James. 
Yeah, that's right, George. Good morning. One of America's closest allies has been thrown into turmoil. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has now been formally charged with bribery, fraud and breach of trust. He is the first ever sitting Israeli Prime Minister to face such charges and the list of alleged wrongdoing is long and colourful. Pink champagne and cigars offered to him by a wealthy friend in return for political favours and a quid pro quo relationship with a telecom tycoon in return for favourable news coverage. He's vowed to stay in office and using perhaps the language of his close ally Donald Trump. He's called the investigation a witch hunt, but the corruption allegations against him have bubbled for months and the country's attorney general has said the ruling shows no one is above the law. TJ. All right, Jay, thank you so much. And now we turn to a scare on a crowded passenger jet, an international flight forced to make an emergency landing just after takeoff because flames were shooting out of an engine. David Curley has the details. It's the terrifying moment this little girl and her family on board a Boeing jet heading from L.A. to the Philippines hears the loud bangs. Flames are erupting from the engine, all caught on camera. Mayday, 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 Philippine 113. We have an engine surge on the right engine requesting a immediate reland. People on the ground catching the dramatic moments as well. Philippine 113, have you say again again the uh, nature of the emergency, please? All right, give a on the right engine. Passengers say the engine had those bursts of flames on and off for 15 minutes before the Philippines Airlines flight landed safely back at LAX 45 minutes after takeoff. Firefighters there to meet the plane on the runway. I was just shaking, I was praying, I was panicking. The problem? This was a compressor stall. It's when the engine essentially backfires like a car. While it's not uncommon, it can be a harrowing experience for everyone on board. A bit frightening, actually. Philippine Airlines did not have a replacement aircraft, so it tried to book passengers on other airlines. Some had to stay in hotels. They hope to get to Manila today, George. I'll bet they do, David. Thanks very much. To the controversy now over a college professor accused of sending racist and sexist tweets but allowed to keep his job because Indian University says he's protected by the First Amendment. Diane Macedo has the story. This morning, an Indiana University professor is facing backlash accused of sharing racist, sexist, and homophobic posts on social media. Earlier this month, business professor Eric Rasmussen shared an article on Twitter arguing women may be destroying academia and quoted the article, writing in part, geniuses are overwhelmingly male. I leaked to an article saying that women were hurting academia, but I wasn't saying I agreed with that article. The tweet went viral, and the university was inundated with demands that he be removed. For a professor to have those views and say them so publicly is really kind of disheartening and very, very disappointing. In a scathing letter, the school's provost says Rasmussen, who's been teaching there since 1992 and has tenure, has pushed bigoted views on social media for years, including that women do not belong in the workplace, that gay men should not be permitted in academia because they're promiscuous, and that black students are generally inferior academically to white students. She also says he will not be fired. We're a public institution and unlike private employers, we're bound by the First Amendment of the Constitution. But Rasmussen is now speaking out, saying his views are being misrepresented and his critics are overreacting. If they're offended, that's, that's their problem. Basically, I, I listen to arguments about why, why they disagree with me, but just saying I'm offended doesn't really impress me. And the university says students will be given options to avoid Rasmussen's class and processes will be put in place to ensure there's no bias in his grading. The professor says he's viewing the whole thing as a learning experience. Hmm. Okay. For a lot of people. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. We're going to turn now to the growing crisis over Prince Andrew, one of his alleged victims speaking out overnight after, of course, that announcement that he is stepping back from public duties as the firestorm grows over his relationship with sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Maggie Ruley has the latest from Buckingham Palace this morning. Good morning, Maggie. Good morning, Cecilia. This decision is unprecedented, and there's no rule book for how the royal family is supposed to respond. Right now, they are simply on damage control, and it has been all hands on deck here at Buckingham Palace. Overnight, Prince Andrew spotted leaving Buckingham Palace. Earlier in the day, the Queen's second son waving at cameras, seen publicly for the first time since announcing he's stepping back from his royal duties. Following what's widely been described as a disastrous interview about his relationship with former friend and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. You were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay.
The royal family having what British papers are calling a crisis summit Thursday. Andrew's ex-wife Sarah Ferguson seen driving into the palace as well. We are now seeing the royal family hold meetings, hold discussions. There's going to be a lot of discussions that have to take place to work out how to move forward. Andrew's now reportedly backing out of a planned work trip to Bahrain this weekend as charities and businesses continue to distance themselves from the royal. Overnight, one of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Jufry, who claimed in past court filings that British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell recruited her when she was just 16 and groomed her to have sex with several of Epstein's powerful friends, including Prince Andrew, reacting to the news. Her attorney telling ABC News, Prince Andrew's recent interview and his subsequent action to withdraw from public life is welcomed news. However, going on to say more needs to be done due to what they call his central role in devastating the lives of countless women. Andrew, who says he has no recollection of ever having met Jufry and categorically denies her allegations. Uh, Andrew and Maxwell both deny all of Jufry's allegations. Both have not been charged with a crime. Andrew even says he has no recollection of even meeting her. But guys, here in the UK, public opinion has definitely turned against Andrew. And now the palace is left trying to keep up the reputation of the monarchy. TJ. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. We want to turn now to a new Tesla truck breaking the Internet. Elon Musk debuted the bulletproof electric cyber truck overnight. Our Rebecca Jarvis is here. Rebecca, I was just thinking the other day I need a bulletproof vehicle, <laughs> but this, uh, this announcement didn't exactly go the way it was supposed to. Yeah, I hope you don't need that vehicle, <laughs> TJ. This is classic Elon Musk. Tesla's new Cybertruck designed to look different than everything else on the road and an unveiling unlike any other. He loves to do the unexpected and this shattered expectations. So I present to you the Cybertruck. Overnight, Tesla CEO Elon Musk unveiling the company's highly anticipated all-new electric pickup, the Cybertruck. Starting at $39,900, it can outrace a Porsche, immediately gaining attention online for its radical metallic look. Doesn't look like anything else. On Twitter, users writing, finally, Elon Musk made the car I always drew when I was five. Another writing, it immediately reminded me of the Homer Simpson car, and I can't believe that this isn't an April Fool's joke. And the truck didn't look much better after this happened during a demonstration of its supposedly unbreakable windows. Oh my God. Well, let's try that, right? Try that on, really? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Oh, man. It didn't go through. Musk tried to brush the gaff off. Just fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> so you could look at this a few different ways. Yes, things didn't go exactly as planned, but the amount of attention the Cybertruck is now getting, how many millions more people have seen this pickup because of that gaffe? He also, there was this funny point at the end where he said, we're giving test rides, just be mindful of the glass. Okay, <laughs> but millions more saw it and confirmed they don't want it, probably. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. We're following a lot of other stories this morning. Next, the Victoria's Secret shakeup, why the company is killing that famous runway show. And the couple who says they're being held against their will in a Mexican hospital after a medical emergency on a cruise. They are speaking out this morning. First, let's go back to Rob. George, check out this video out of Phoenix. This is not snow. This is hail, even a double rainbow there. But the kids, don't tell that to the kids because they took the sleds out and they said it doesn't snow in Phoenix, but this is, this is close enough. Time for your weekend getaways now. Brought to you by CarMax. If there's going to be a sticker on your car, it has to mean something. That you got into college or crossed the finish line eventually. What? That you went someplace worth going. Or maybe you have opinions. But if it's on there, it has to mean something. So we make sure this means something. That we've done everything to make your shopping, test driving, and car buying experience the way it should be. CarMax. A mild and a dry start to your Friday, but we're looking at some midday showers. Shower chance after 9 a.m. and should be ending by 3 p.m. High today, 54 degrees. Once that front moves through your next weather maker, it's going to get a little breezy and much colder. So if you're going to anything this evening, like maybe high school football, that 42 at 8 o'clock feeling more like 32. Sunshine returns Sunday after another dose of rain coming your way after 3 p.m. tomorrow. They got us. We're still talking about the truck. The truck. You want one? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> it breaks easily. Oh <laughs> Hi. 
I'm Jillian, and I have a confession to make. I may have been a little tough in my past, Down. Up. but now I've found my bubbly side.